Hi, I'm David Gregg, and I am recording this orientation for the Rhode Island BioBlitz 2022, which we're going to hold in Bristol, Barrington, and Warren along the East Bay bike path on June 10th and 11th, 2022. Before we get started, I'd like to thank our sponsors. So for many, many years, the Roger Williams Park Zoo has been the lead sponsor of the Rhode Island BioBlitz. We also have this year the local host, Audubon Society of Rhode Island, and Science Central will be at their site at the Audubon Nature Center in Bristol. And we have had great cooperation with all three towns, Bristol, Barrington, and Warren. So we'd like to thank the town staffs and the conservation commissions and land trusts in those towns. And we have financial uh, support this year from Blount Fine Foods, which is based in the East Bay there and has a number of restaurants and other food businesses that are really terrific. And we have Largest Forestry as usual as one of our longest standing supporters. Uh, I'd also like to take this moment to remember we owe our office space and a lot of other support to the University of Rhode Island, College of the Environment and Life Sciences. So what is the orientation going to include? First of all, we're gonna talk about what is a BioBlitz? What is this BioBlitz thing anyway? And we're gonna talk about why we BioBlitz, how we do the counting. We'll talk a little bit about the sites along East Bay bike path that we're gonna be classing as inbounds and out of bounds. And we'll talk about safety and we'll have some questions at the end. So, uh, BioBlitz has been going on for 22 years. I think we can um, make the case that the Rhode Island BioBlitz is the oldest continuously run BioBlitz in the world. During those 22 years, we have had over 3,400 participants, and we have made 21,250 species identifications. Now, obviously, they're not 21,000 different species, but there's thousands of different species, and um, each time we identify a species, it's another point of data in our understanding of the state of Rhode Island. And in this map, each one of these red dots is a, a place where a bioblitz has been held. You can see they've been all over the state. And so we've actually been able to build up a bit of a picture of the biodiversity and ecological conditions in Rhode Island by doing bioblitzes in so many places over the years. This year's BioBlitz is right here in the East Bay, and um, each one of these little blue uh, markers is a BioBlitz site. And this is this year's right here. So a BioBlitz is a, an effort by volunteer scientists to count as many species of life as they can in 24 hours on a particular parcel of land. And they've been held, as I said, all around, we've held ours all around Rhode Island, they're held all around the United States and all around the world, in fact. So why do we BioBlitz? Well, I can break the goals down into four broad categories. And for the general public, I think it's BioBlitz is really valuable for making the point that biodiversity doesn't just occur in rainforests or some far off part of the world. But biodiversity can occur right here in Rhode Island, in fact, right under your very feet. The first BioBlitz that we held was in Roger Williams Park, which is essentially a mown lawn and a lot of packed dirt. And yet we found over 660 species of animals and plants in 24 hours. So that's remarkable. No piece of land is a write-off. Every piece of land has amazing biodiversity to find if you just have a reason to go looking. That's BioBlitz. Now for naturalists and managers, the a lot of people say they have an interest in birds or plants, gardening or something like that, or they want, they'd like to learn more about something and butterflies or, or something in the environment. And how do you turn that general interest into active engagement? How do you take those first steps to be, become comfortable with learning about a new taxon or with natural history generally? And you come to BioBlitz and there are all these, there's experts on things, there's kids and rank novices who are just feeling their way around in this stuff. And everybody learns together. And if you are, if you do have a general interest and you want to convert it into engagement, it can happen at BioBlitz. And of course, for land conservators, 
you know, a lot of times these are people who are, you know, a land trust, a handful of people who meet in sort of town hall basement. They, yeah, they conserve land, but, but what's really the point of, of what they do? Well, suddenly BioBlitz comes in with 200 people from all around the Northeast and talks about how amazing this land they've been conserving is. And it really helps to get the message out that their work is meaningful and the conservation that they're doing is making a difference in a, a broader, in a broader landscape. And of course, for school children, I like to say that this is a direct, minimally predictable contact with nature. The thing about BioBlitz is you let the kids find their way in the natural environment. So they go out looking for frogs and they get into swamps. They go out in the middle of the night to find moths and they get lost in the dark and scared by noises. And it gives them a new relationship with the natural environment. And of course, one of the main points of doing this is to get those kids outdoors and um, in direct contact with the natural environment. Now, there's another point about BioBlitz that I, I make, and that is um, it's exemplifying something about how science works and uh, sort of modeling the scientific process. And so if you take it, here's two examples, here's um, two people, both of whom claim that um, they used science to answer a question. And the answer is, you know, whatever they say it is. Now, one of these people is an august astrophysicist with an enormous amount of accomplishments uh, behind him. And the other one is a Fox News commentator. They both say they use science. So how are we to distinguish between them? Well, the public really needs a better understanding of how science works in order to be able to make a judgment about what they're hearing from people in the media, people like this who are in the media. Science is this, fall, is this gray space back here that nobody really understands. And a lot of times when, when you study, you know, the scientific method in high school, you're really studying this, the funnel part here, um, analysis of data, peer review, uh, hypothesis formation, null hypothesis and, and hypothesis testing and all, that sort of stuff. And rarely do we really look at what's above the funnel. What's all the stuff that goes into that funnel of hypothesis testing and data analysis? The field work, the pilot studies, the more field work, the you, you fundraise, you design some sort of instrument, put it on a ship, sail it halfway around the world, use it for three hours and it breaks. So you've got to do it all over again. You get out in the field, you fall in the mud, or you, you need to do something uh, is in the dirt and it pours rain, or it's frozen when you get there and you can't dig a thing. This is all the stuff that makes the scientific statement at the end meaningful because it's the data gathering. And we almost never get to witness the wide end of the funnel where all this stuff really comes in. And that's where BioBlitz, that's what BioBlitz is doing. Um, the weather will be whatever it is. We have no idea whether it's going to be good butterfly weather or good weather for ducks. Of course, we've discovered things like the first nine spotted ladybug that uh, was seen in Rhode Island. In fact, except for a couple of sites um, further south, the nine spotted ladybug that we found during the 2014 BioBlitz at Rocky Point was the first of its species found east of the Great Plains in decades. And we've since found another one in Rhode Island, which is really exciting. Uh, we found the first mosquito fish ever uh, known from Rhode Island during a bio blitz. We found um, a leech that feeds off of shrimp. Did you know that shrimp have leeches? Well, they do. And of course, we've had a lot of other outcomes from BioBlitz. There's an only a game episode about it. This is the Boston Public Radio sports show. And there's a half hour documentary that ran on Rhode Island Public Broadcasting called BioBlitz Discovering Nature's Neighborhood that was made with the Coastal Institute at URI. And there are scientific peer reviewed 
journal articles. This is an article about using a BioBlitz to sample ant species richness. And the research for this was done at the BioBlitz in um, 2013 in Narragansett. And of course, BioBlitz is actually mentioned in the Rhode Island Wildlife Action Plan as one of the monitoring methods that Rhode Island counts on. Now, how do we count in BioBlitz? So first of all, we're counting species. That's, you can count, you can analyze lots of things uh, to uh, monitor in the environmental uh, condition, but in this particular case, we're counting species. That's what this is about. And we're counting all the species within bounds. There's, we'll talk about what those boundaries are. And it's a team sport. So the teams are organized around taxonomic categories of animals and plants. And we'll talk a little bit about that. And of course, it's supposed to be fun. This is that, the, that engagement goal comes from it being fun and something that people look forward to doing every year. People come year after year and it's a high point of their, of their season. Uh, what do we count? We, we're counting species and we're counting them in teams that are organized around the phylogenetic tree of life. It's a way of organizing all the diversity of life into categories that mean something and primarily based on their evolutionary um, path. So you have um, the animals and the animals are divided into vertebrates and invertebrates. And if you take a uh, uh, invertebrates, you can have asymmetric ones and radially symmetric ones and bilaterally symmetric ones, pteridophytes, the ferns, and uh, gymnosperms and angiosperms, the different kinds of seed bearers. Of course, there's lichens and fungi. And then each one of these corresponds with taxonomic teams. Okay. Why is taxonomy a good way to do this? Well, <clears throat> If you know something about one particular organism and then you place it into a group of organisms based on its evolution and its physical characteristics, then you start to know something about everything else that's in that group. Now, when we're recording, we're going to talk about putting everything down on these pink sheets of paper, which we'll be handing out at Science Central. This is the Ryborf the Rhode Island BioBlitz observation reporting form. And uh, I'd like everybody to try to get their species observations onto these forms and try to organize the forms based on the taxa that you're recording. So you put your name here and the taxonomic team that, or the taxon or, or team that on this particular form. And then you write down your species on, um, on these lines, and you can make notes about your finds on, in this column. Uh, there's a bunch of things that can go here. You can talk about the method that you use to catch it. You can talk about where you found it. You can talk about um, uh, what kind of uh, organism it is. A lot of times, if there are scientific binomials in this column, I have no idea what those are. I won't know whether it's a lichen or a tree or a fly or a clam. And it's very helpful for organizing things if you put some sort of indication of what this is. Uh, you can tell me it's a crustacean or a worm or a bird or whatever you, you know about it in this column. So uh, I said we were going to talk a little bit about boundaries. Now, you have to, for a variety of reasons, we have to stay in bounds. It has to do with you know, the land that we've had, we have permission to work on. Uh, it has to do with being respectful of the neighbors. Uh, it has to do with being safe. We Specimens have to be in bounds, <clears throat> except for specimens that are either flying or swimming. So for the flying ones, if you see a bird in the distance, let's say a, 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 a cormorant flies overhead during the bio blitz, <clears throat> it's very hard to tell whether it's exactly over the bio blitz boundary or not. So we let you just count it. So if it's a flying thing, you can count it if you can identify it. If it's a swimming thing, uh, if you can identify, even if it's three miles away, if you can identify a whale spout out in the bay or something, 
you can count whale. You can write down whale. The, the same thing kind of goes for fish. So obviously the fish on the seaward side of a bioblitz, and, and we have coastline in this one, they could be any distance out to sea. And if you're sort of, I don't know, if you're wading around trying to catch fish or if you're casting out to catch fish, it's hard to say that you're inbounds or out of bounds. So we wanted to have a way of determining how far out to sea you can count stuff when you're uh, netting or fishing. And for this purpose, we've decided that it's twice the distance you can cast with a five inch Creek Chub Striper Strike popping plug with an eight foot fiberglass spinning rod and 15 pound test line. Now, and, it, and it's twice that length because if you're bio blitzing in a boat and you're casting towards shore, those things would count. But who's to say if you're casting towards shore or at an angle from shore, and that way we don't have to, we don't have to dicker about whether, what, what, whether you were casting towards shore or some other direction. Uh, we also have this rule called the rule of least duplication. And um, this is because not everything we find is going to be identifiable to species. In fact, there are probably hundreds of flies and wasps and other stuff that nobody would be able to identify to species. Some cases they're not even ident they're not even known species at all. So you can put down an identification that is not all the way to species. And the example on this slide is you say, I saw an insect. Now, if nobody else at the whole BioBlitz says they saw an insect, that'll count. That'll be one, one species identification. If somebody says they saw a bee, so if you write down insect and somebody else says, writes down bee, there's no way of knowing whether the thing you saw was a bee or not. So we have to throw it away because we have a more specific identification. Now, if somebody writes down B and somebody else writes down Bombus SP, there's no way to tell whether the B was a Bombus or some other kind of B. And so to avoid duplication, we have to throw out the one that's less specific. And the same thing if somebody writes down Bombus Affinus, uh, we have to throw out the Bombus SP because we don't know that that wasn't an Affinus and we don't want duplication. That's the rule of least duplication. And the rule of help us out here is um, that one about tell me what I'm looking at. So um, when we're doing the data entry uh, and somebody says it's a uh, Imanthus hoponensis, I don't know whether that is a kind of mouse or a kind of fungus or an annelid worm. So since you know, write it down. Okay, and that's where that's where this uh, this side of the ribworth comes it comes in. So this is a little bit of what it looks like: taxonomic teams on the hunt. So you go out, you look around, um, use whatever methods your taxonomic team is going to use, or or maybe several different methods. So night lighting for moths, or seine netting, or uh, fishing, snorkeling. Flipping over boards, the herp, the herp team does a lot of board and rock flipping. So then you bring a lot of stuff you can identify as you're out walking around. And obviously you don't bring back everything. And if you see a deer or a raccoon, you just write down deer or raccoon. You don't have to bring it back. In fact, we encourage you not to. Um, but if you find uh, a lot of things, you have to bring back to Science Central in order to key it out and to try to figure out what it is. And, some things will come back to Science Central uh, to be kind of an educational display. We'll label things on, on we'll label mushrooms on paper plates and people can look at them. And um, so then uh, you write everything down once you've identified it, you put everything on the Ryborf and you turn it in. And at the end of the Saturday, I will make some sort of announcement about the preliminary results. And um, that's just so we all leave knowing about how we did. It's going to take months before all the team captains get me their completed lists. A lot of these things have to be sent off to be identified, not just to experts. So it takes a little while to get the, the full final results in. Now, we also have some teams that aren't taxonomic, but they're traditional in natural history. One of them is the creative writing team. Uh, we also have an art team. And 
art uh, artists have accompanied natural history natural history expeditions since the beginning of natural history in the end of the 17th century and there's a lot that artists have to tell us about a place that's what we're doing in biobits we're investigating a place trying to learn wh what it's all about artists have a lot to to tell us about a place that you can't learn by um, making a list of the species so uh, we have an art team and we encourage the artists to tell us things that they're surprised by uh, at this site or tell us things that really strike you about where we are or uh, relationships or the light or the water and of course we have an education team we want to engage young people with the BioBlitz event. So we have taxonomic teams and the taxonomic teams have a bunch of different functions. They organize the species reporting. I, if everybody just went willy nilly, I'd have 18 riborf sheets all with the same things on them. The bird team needs to get organized so we don't get you know 200 recordings of chickadee and blue jay. They're going to enhance team identity. Now, uh, this, this picture here is a picture of the litter bugs, and that's a team that has uh, sort of a very high level of organization. Other teams are much more informal. Uh, people all just sort of come to the BioBlitz and then work together when they're there. And, and then there are teams where there's only one real expert, and um, it's really sort of a, a solo effort, maybe with a couple of helpers who we've been able to find who are willing to work with that person. Teams are very helpful for improving general coverage. So um, fish is a good example. There are a lot of different fish habitats at this year's BioBlitz. And unless that team gets organized, they're, they're you know, at risk of missing some of them. So if everybody goes to the beach and tries to catch stripers with fishing rods, they're gonna miss the minnows that live in the mud in the salt marsh or the interesting fish that live in the freshwater at Brickyard Pond. And of course, uh, the taxonomic teams allows us to do some fun things like year to year um, comparisons. So we have, we know about how many species of mammals, birds, herps, plants, and uh, butterflies, and Odonata are one can expect in Rhode Island. And one of the things that's kind of fun is to see which team can get closest to the maximum number uh, in Rhode Island. And it's the herps. The herp team consistently gets the highest percentage the, the closest to the maximum um, maximum number of species in Rhode Island. Now if you want more information about BioBlitz Bio and how it works there are um, a couple of videos up about BioBlitz uh, on our YouTube channel. So the site for this year East Bay Bike Path and Boundaries these are eco regions. It's you know sort of in the upper uh, left corner. These are more higher elevation, mountainous, uh, mountainous. You know, in the east, mountain is relative, mountainous terrain. And this is the coastal plain down here, and and this is very much in on the coast in the in the um, in the coastal eco region. And uh, I, I like to use this as the hillshade layer from ArcGIS Online. You can see how flat it is. So this is, um, this is Bristol and you see Bristol, this is Mount Hope. You can see it's got some elevation to it, but this is Warren and this is Barrington. You can see it's right down on sea level. So this is, sea level is one of the interesting stories about this site where we're gonna be this year. So there's the, there's the um, bike path and this is the Audubon uh, Nature Center down here off of Hope Street in Bristol. Um, Jacobs Point. This is Burrs Hill. <clears throat> this is Belcher Cove, Police Cove Park, and Brickyard Pond. And we'll have a little Satellite Science Central at Brickyard Pond. But look at how, so, you know, trains, trains don't like hills. Um, so you can see that this train, what used to, the bike path used to be a train track. And look at, it's right at sea level, even, even to the extent here in Warren. So there's a little rise here in Main Street in Warren, and it kind of goes behind it and sticks on the shore on the other side. The only place where there's any elevation at all is right here, and there's a cut through, uh, through it right there. So very flat. 
Um, this is downtown Warren. It's quite densely developed. Main Street in Barrington is here. We'll be in Brickyard Pond, which is a big um, conservation uh, area to the southwest of downtown Barrington. So uh, let's talk about the bike path itself. Uh, it's very straight, very flat, and it has, well, there's a lot of invasives along either side, let's be honest. Um, but there's also a lot of, there are a lot of wetlands and there are a lot of little nooks and crannies with um, microclimates. So it should be actually kind of interesting to know what we can find along it. Uh, we do not have we, have, we have a permit to use the bike path for transportation to and from different spots of the BioBlitz, but because the bike path will be open and heavily used by the general public, we can't have any organized activities actually on the bike path itself. So you can walk along the bike path and, and look for birds or walk along the bike path and, and count plants or look for butterflies. Uh, you could do it in small groups as, as you might if you were going for a walk on the bike path, but we won't be having any organized walks or gatherings on the bike path itself. And so how, how far off the bike path is in bounds? Well, we decided that we were going to count anything that we, any animals or plants you find within, um, basically within two and a half bike paths widths of the center line or the width of the bike path and two widths on each side, or until you come to private property, a neighbor, a, a neighboring yard or something like that, whichever you come to first. And there are eight pieces of conservation land along the bike path that we're also going to have inbounds. And here they are. And then we'll take them in order from south to north. This is the Audubon Nature Center in Bristol. And uh, it's, it goes all the way from um, 114 all the way to the water in a strip. And then this is the Jacobs Point um, salt marsh. This is the Audubon building itself. Now, uh, when you get to the bottom of the Audubon property, there's a boardwalk that goes out into the salt marsh and um, you cross the bike path and you can see this is the beach at the far end of the boardwalk. It's actually a really nice spot. Um, there'll be lots of interesting things there. Uh, Jacobs Point Marsh, as I mentioned, and we have to be careful there because there are very rare salt marsh sparrows nesting there. And we'll, generally speaking, stay off of the marsh platform because they nest down in the grass. They're very inconspicuous and we don't want, um, we don't want to, uh, any harm to come to them. Um, but that's okay because most of the biodiversity that happens in the salt marsh, you can count from its edges or by looking into it. And Burr's Hill. Burr's Hill is um, a little bit up the bike path from Jacob's Point. And it's mostly a public, public playing fields and, and lawn. And there might be some interesting things there like ants in this um, hard packed sun struck earth and maybe some ground nesting wasps. But it's also a highly significant location because it is the site of the royal burial ground of the Wampanoag tribe. This remains a really important ground to the Wampanoags and we want to acknowledge that. So now we come to Belcher Cove. Belcher Cove is at the north end of Warren and um, we have, uh, there's a little piece of conservation land here on the south end of it and then all of this salt marsh here and um, we have permission to enter via Kelly Street and park at the Warren German American Club. So we want to stay away from that building. There's, there's um, a little bit of space on the other side of the parking lot where we can leave our bikes or if you're driving you can you can park and um, look at what's in this salt marsh here. And we are talking with the Massasoit Historical Association which manages the North Burial Ground which is just the other side of the bike path from Belcher Cove um, salt marsh. And since the bike path is right next to this burial ground, I thought it would be appropriate for the Lycan team to take a look at it. Um, and hopefully we will meet up with one of the people from the Massasoit 
Historical Association on Saturday morning, and they'll let us in to look at the lichens at the North Burial Ground. And then we come to Police Cove Park, which is uh, primarily a parking and picnic area, but it does have a boat ramp into this very energetic tidal channel, which could have some really interesting things in it. And then, we'll come, of course, we come to Brickyard Pond, which is the largest of the parcels. And this pond actually is uh, used to be a, um, a quarry for brick clay, thus Brickyard Pond. And then it became flooded and it has a channel to the ocean. So it has a herring run. It's salt stratified. There are probably blue crabs in it. Uh, it's a birding hotspot. It's really, really interesting. And we're going to have, here's the bike path, comes along here. We're going to have a little setup here at Veterans Memorial Park. So there's a, this is the bike path here. And there's this um, grassy path that extends down to Veterans Memorial Park. If you're traveling by car on uh, 114, you come down Maple Ave here and then Middle Highway and down Legion Way to get to get to this spot. There is a boat ramp here, so if you want, if you're going to put in a canoe or something to explore the pond, um, you can do that. You can also access the Brickyard Pond area down this road past the YMCA, and this is a, a town ball field here. So just a few things to say about safety. BioBlitz, um, is a direct, minimally predictable encounter with nature, but we don't want it to be harmful. Participating in BioBlitz is entirely voluntary. If you don't want to follow the safety rules that we set out, don't come. And if you see somebody who is not following the safety rules, please let somebody from the Natural History Survey know about it, and um, we will address the situation up to and including asking the parties to leave. So the basic things, uh, no firearms, no alcohol, no fires, no loud music, and no drones. So I know drones are the cool thing, and um, uh, we've had a lot of people say they wanted to bring drones, but we have had uh, problematic encounters with drones and the wildlife that we're there to um, enumerate. So um, we're, we've just made a rule, no drones. Now we have a lot of water uh, at this site and we want um, people to be careful around water. So um, don't go into water by yourself. Have a buddy, uh, wear a personal flotation device. Uh, wade, don't swim. There's, there's almost nothing that you would be able to discover by swimming that you couldn't also discover by wading in a much safer manner. And stay out of water after dark, please. Stone walls are dangerous and they are extremely expensive to repair if you knock stones off them. So please stay off stone walls. Please don't take stone walls apart looking for things in them. You can flip a stone or two and put it back, but don't deconstruct walls. Um, ticks, there are, <laughs> there will be ticks. Ticks carry all kinds of horrible diseases and, um, the best way to practice tick safety is to treat your BioBlitz gear with permethrin. Um, this is how you use it. You spray it on before the BioBlitz and let your clothes dry. And then you'll have really good protection against ticks. Also, of course, you'll see a lot of us in long pants with our pant cuffs tucked into our socks. It's a stylish look and it means that you're a really thoughtful and knowledgeable naturalist, if you look like that. This is poison ivy. I think uh, you wanna stay out of it. If you don't know what poison ivy looks like, ask the botany team. And there's things like mosquitoes and coronavirus. As an organization that promotes science and its use in everyday activities, we encourage everybody to be up on, on their coronavirus vaccines. However, there are people who have underlying conditions or who uh, live with people who are at high risk and they may choose to wear a mask. So everybody will um, uh, make people 
feel comfortable at BioBlitz whether they choose to wear a mask or not. So the other hazards, traffic is a big deal uh, for this BioBlitz. Um, it isn't sometimes for some BioBlitzes, but Route 114 is very busy and the turnout from the Audubon Nature Center onto 114 is um, busy and a difficult turn to make. So um, please be careful at that turn. And the bike path is really dangerous because people bike down it um, very quickly. Uh, walkers should stay on the left, walk facing traffic as you would on a regular road, and bikers stay to the right. Um, in this case, bikers are the vehicles and walkers are the pedestrians. There's not much of a chance of you meeting dangerous wildlife, but it could happen. If you see rabies vectors like raccoons acting strangely, stay away um, and let somebody know. Don't handle wildlife that you don't have to handle in order to identify it. And because we have water, you wanna watch out for power boats. This is a bike path BioBlitz. So we want everybody to come home with the same number of bikes as they came to BioBlitz with. So uh, lock your bike and wear a helmet. This is the bike path BioBlitz. I hope everybody will wear a helmet and keep their head full of natural historical knowledge, safe and sound. So a few more rules. The BioBlitz will have a, has a Rhode Island DEM scientific collector's permit, um, which allows us to collect and handle the animals that we need to handle in order to identify them. Uh, however, if your particular collecting activity involves some other specialist permit, such as um, lobster trapping or scuba diving or mist netting of birds, you're responsible for having the appropriate permits. Some rules about animals. Uh, treat animals humanely. Don't move animals or plants unless you need to do so for identification. If you want to use an animal for a demonstration, a fish, a frog, or something like that, um, Please limit yourself to just one. We don't want people bringing legions of frogs back to Science Central. Um, and you absolutely, if you do pick up or move an organism, you absolutely have to put it back exactly where you found it. Uh, as part of our scientific collector's permit, we want to be able to report to Rhode Island DEM about any voucher specimens that are collected. Um, uh, if you are someone working in a taxon that has to be collected really to be identified, ants and wasps and moths and stuff like that, be sure to let us know where, what specimens you've taken and where they ultimately will end up. So um, the mammals and some of the insects end up at Harvard, uh, the plants go to the URI herbarium, uh, some of the insects go to Yale or Yukon, um, let us know what um, collections holding institution you have a relationship with if you if you're vouchering um, specimens and taking them away from BioBlitz. Okay, wrapping it up here with some expectations. So um, in order to participate in BioBlitz, you have to check in and the check in is at the Audubon Nature Center. You have to, with, uh, at the check in, you'll receive your safety and instructions. You have to sign a liability waiver and a photo release. There, that is, those are conditions of participation. Um, you have to pre-register. There's no walk-ins for BioBlitz and be assigned to a team. Now we have teams for um, artists. So we have a, a person team. So everybody, everybody can have a role, whether or not you're a taxonomic expert. If you want to, there's lots of teams that need people to carry buckets or dig holes and you'll learn a lot. Um, or you can find uh, something to do in the human team or the art team or the creative writing team. So, but everybody has to be assigned to a team. You have to agree to follow the rules and you have to follow the rules. Um, and if you're a minor, you have to be accompanied by a parent or guardian at all times. Um, please don't just drop your kids off at BioBlitz. Uh, really, really urge people to wear helmets on the bike path and life jackets when they're in or around the water. Watch out for motor vehicle traffic on Route 114. It is a very busy road 
and watch out for bicycle traffic on the bike path. So the other things that we hope everyone will do is to um, introduce themselves to people you don't know around the um, Science Central. Ask lots of questions. Um, even the experts, the, the most knowledgeable people there don't know everything. So we're all, we're all there to contribute what we can and to have a good time and to meet each other. And so um, we encourage that everybody um, will treat it as a fun um, opportunity and a learning experience. And that is the end of the slideshow.